Hello, we're here with James Donaldson, who's running for Seattle City Council District Number 7. Would you like to go ahead with your two-minute introduction? Sure, yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here and uh, uh, having a forum for us to discuss and introduce ourselves to, to the electric out there. Uh, my name is James Donaldson, and I am a longtime Seattle resident uh, in the neighborhood of Magnolia in the District 7. Uh, I've been there almost 40 years. Uh, we graduated from Washington State University in 1979, so this is my 40th anniversary of that. Moved to Seattle in 1980 and began playing with the Seattle Supersonics, the NBA basketball team, for the first three years of my professional basketball life. Uh, and then moved on to other countries and other cities beyond that, uh, playing for a total of 20 years professional basketball. But at the meantime, becoming a small business entrepreneur and a small business owner with the Donaldson Clinic which is a, a chain of physical therapy and sports rehabilitation clinics. We ran that for 28 years until just last year when I decided to finally close that down and move on to a couple of new chapters of my life. Uh, one being a candidate for Seattle City Council, District 7. Uh, I bring uh, a world of experience to, to this front uh, with business ownership, being a small business advocate, uh, working with mental issues and health challenges and things like that. Uh, being a community person, very involved in my, not only my community, but communities all throughout Seattle for almost all 40 years that I've been in Seattle. And just continuing to work with our youth in education and mentorship programs as well to train them up to be the best they can very be when they get a little bit older. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will get started on the questions. You may flip over that sheet of paper, and uh, Katie, would you go ahead and start? <coughs> um, uh, if elected, what policies will you support to address the need for affordable housing and homelessness services? Yes, well, I know that's an ongoing issue here in Seattle, and it has been for quite a while. Uh, I've paid attention to it throughout the years and really have been involved, especially with uh, trying to find uh, ways for affordable housing. Uh, to create more and more sustainable housing for the homeless folks and also homeless services. I'm sure all you all saw the, the recent documentary, Seattle is Dying, which I did not agree with. Uh, I think Seattle is a fantastic city, uh, you know, almost iconic global city from around the world. I just returned from mainland China a couple weeks ago, and I go to China quite often, two or three times a year, working with education programs and, and mental health now, and that, basketball training and all kind of things. So the folks in China know Seattle very well as a global, iconic city. There's a great movie, uh, you know, uh, Sleepless in Seattle, which they all had followed years ago. And they made their own version of that when Beijing meets Seattle. It's a similar kind of light, uh, you know, love comedy thing and uh, in the Chinese style version. So they know Seattle very well. I know Seattle very well. I've been here, like I said, 40 years uh, and very involved. So. Uh, with the affordable housing piece, I'd like to take a look more closely at all of the policies that are in place currently for developers to come into Seattle. Uh, what is it that we are asking them to do? What is it they're required to do? And to make sure that they follow that. It's not just a matter of putting it into the paperwork and then ship it off somewhere else. We want to make sure it's in the buildings that we are talking about and pertaining to, and they're actually building and partaking in. So this is a collaborative effort to make sure that all of us fully understand what's expected, uh, what's reasonable, what's realistic, and to move forward and get those things done. Uh, the homeless services, uh, as I mentioned with uh, the Seattle Dying documentary, I love the, uh, the reference to the program they had in Rhode Island, where the intervention came into place. Uh, so they got a lot of those folks into, into their uh, treatment sessions of alcohol or drug, what have you, mental health and made sure that they follow through with that for a while to see if they can really help turn those lives around. That's the only way we're gonna be able to deal with it is really in intervene at an earliest possible point and to stay with it sustainably. Okay, thank you. Alice? Uh, Seattle has the most regressive tax code in a state with the most regressive tax code in the country. Uh, given the repeal of the head tax and the ongoing litigation over the city income tax, how would you raise more progressive revenue to help fund city services? Well, I think uh, we've become a magnet for quite a few global corporations to either start up here in Seattle or become of the Seattle, uh, part of the Seattle fabric. 
those corporations, of course, they get some benefits derived from moving here in the first place, creating all the great jobs they do. I was against the head tax from the start, even when I heard about that uh, over the last year or so, and I was glad the city council went back on that and, and took that away. But I think a way to really uh, get corporations to contribute almost willingly more is to take a look at a lot of the loopholes that they have in their agreements and their clauses and their contracts with the city and other services that we're providing with them. Uh, if those loopholes are overly favorable to the corporation, have a meaningful discussion with them to close some of those loopholes, to be able to divvy up some of that revenue a little bit more back into the coffers here in Seattle. Uh, that's one way to go about it. I think there are, uh, you know, millions, tens of millions of dollars a year that can be realized just from going after some of those uh, loopholes that are existing already in a much, in, in a very much favorable way for the corporation. Thank you. Laura? Given the city's reset of the Move Seattle levy, the upcoming expiration of the city's bus funding tax, and the planning for light rail through much of our district, what will be your priorities in deciding how the city spends its transportation funds? Yeah, well, uh, looking at all of that evolve over the last four decades, as I have, and uh, most of you have, some of you weren't around four decades ago. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I'm much in favor of you know increasing and making more efficient our transit system. Uh, I'm in favor of light rail and and uh, even the old railway uh, uh, trolley cars and putting those tracks in place that become a permanent fixture of the infrastructure. Uh, once you put tracks down, it's hard to just go in and dig all that up and redo something differently without some really careful planning and, and processing of all of that. But if you make the commitment to rails. Uh, light rails and trolley cars that can connect our neighborhoods a, a little bit more efficiently. Uh, I think one, you'll find a big increase in the amount of tourists who can get here from our piers where the cruise ship stops now. Uh, there's fleets and fleets of taxis and things that go there every time the cruise ships come in and they run them all downtown, they run them all back down to the ship terminal. If we had some type of light rail, some type of trolley system, some, some type of iconic symbol of, of Seattle, like the Space Needle, like the monorail. And people know that they can get a wonderful ride along the waterfront and up into downtown, Pike Place and everything else. That would go a long ways towards uh, helping our, our transit the issues that we're having. Excellent, thank you. All right. uh, how will you continue the process of reforming the Seattle Police Department beyond the expiration of the consent decree? Yes, again, as a council member, I, I, would, I will be involved with quite a few of the committees on the council anyway. I, I really like to involve myself and to learn as much as I possibly can. I want to take a look at the agreement that's in place, the reform that came in place 10, 15 years ago to, to, to have the Department of Justice come in the first place and take a look at how things are going. It's not normally uh, the best of signals we want to send out from Seattle. So to take a look, to update what needs to be updated, uh, to improve what needs to be improved, and maybe to do away with something that really has no, no matter in, in the matter in the first place. So I think that's one way to do it is to really sit down as a council member, study the issue, go through it, get the best, uh, the best practice advices from around the country, and then come back and represent that so we can move forward uh, collaboratively. Okay. Thank you. Clayton? Clayton, sorry. Last one, sorry. <laughs> um, now we may open them up to the rest of the uh, other questions. Starting with Robert, these are one minute responses. Okay. So, you know, uh, you have worked at the Key Arena, you probably have business here at the Key Arena, and we all know the Key Arena is being renovated. Um, and having, I think, 40 home dates during winter, people are wondering, like, how do you manage the traffic and yes. transit? So, what would you do if you're representing District 7 on the City Council to ensure that once the NHL starts and maybe even hopefully someday NBA, mm -hmm. uh, we can manage that effectively while light rail is 15 years away? What, what can we do the interim to help get people in and out of there using transit? You know, I think we have to employ more uh, traffic uh, personnel to be out there moving people through the stoplights and making sure that the traffic moves efficiently. I was just talking to a business owner right there on Mercer Street uh, around the corner from the Key Arena, and she's been there for 20 years. Uh, and she told me that when the Sonics left, her business lost a million dollars a year. She has to employ her own security force of eight part-time 
rent-a-cop kind of security personnel so out there all the time. She had she got run, run down the street by uh, some vagrant on the street a few weeks ago uh, because it's a late night place after 11 or 12 p.m. You know she's being chased down the street. So th these are the things that we're having to face with our business community, not only in Queen Anne but all over downtown Seattle. All these business owners are crying out for more help, more support, uh, more cooperation with the city and to be able to, so they can be able to thrive. I think about the tourists to come and visit our city as well. And so many of them do not want to come into downtown because they've heard of what they've heard. Thank you. Matt. Uh, I want to just clarify on your answer from uh, question one. Um, when you were talking about homeless services, you talked about how you did like the Rhode Island program that was featured in Seattle's dying. So, uh, but, and the reason you liked it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is because you said it was urban. Now, the program that was in Seattle's dying was one that we actually do have in the state is when people are already incarcerated. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify, was that what you meant or did you want something that does involved earlier, and then also as a follow-up on that, while addiction does disproportionately impact people who are homeless, yes. do you believe everyone who is homeless is addicted? Good question. Uh, I am not so much for continuing to incarcerate the homeless uh, for being homeless or having whatever illness it is inside of any uh, criminal activities. Uh, we can't arrest our way out of this. And so what I saw with Seattle's Dying and the documentary and the program from Rhode Island seemed to be a somewhat early intervention program for the homeless and mentally ill. I don't know how they got them to enroll in the program in the first place. There must have been an exchange. It, it was only for people who were already incarcerated. Only for, oh, okay. So it was, it was for people who were incarcerated. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, well, that's why I'm, I'm asking. Thank you. Thanks for clarification. I, I didn't catch that myself. So so I would say dealing with the folks who are on the street is really going out there with a caseworker. We should have a case file on each and every one of these folks so we know who they are, what they're suffering from, what their issues are, and how we can best provide help with that. But that needs to be followed up. You can't just throw that uh, dart at the wall and, and stick it there. and hope it's going to hang in there for 12 months. You know, you got to you know, follow up continually with the caseworkers. They should go in with escorted by security personnel so they feel safe. It's an expense, but I think as we continue to ingrain ourselves into the lives of the homeless, we can help them get up and finally back on their feet and off the streets. Great. Thank you. Uh, Alice. What, uh, what are your thoughts on um, single family zoning and maybe sort of our approach to, to that moving forward? Yeah, I am not really all the way up to speed with single family zoning. I, I, of course, I have a single family residence myself in Magnolia. Um, and I, I think you're talking about the, 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 the backyard cottages and other little mini things or? Yeah, just, um, you know, like, yeah, various ways of changing single family zoning to have more people living in some of those neighborhoods. To increase the density, as yeah. we we're always talking about, yeah. And it's gonna to have to be a matter of fact as we move forward the next 20, 30 years, Seattle's gonna continue growing. It's growing by leaps and bounds now, and, uh, and we have a limited geographical footprint that we stay in, and we can't go much further beyond that, so we have to increase density. So yes, I would be in favor of the city taking a look at uh, opportunities to increase density in neighborhoods, if, if a single family uh, homeowner wanted to add a small resident in their backyard and be able to work out with the city, I would be able to look at those kind of programs and uh, see the benefits of all that for both parties involved, uh, for all parties involved, and then take it from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, um, were you elected, what would you do to stop the sweeps? Stop the sweeps? Uh, you're talking about the uh, basically come in and sweep everybody up off the street? Or? Correct. Okay. Wow. Uh, I was not quite aware that that was going on to any great extent. Uh, do they have periodic times that they do that or schedule? They're doing it all the time. <laughs> all the time. Wow. wow. <laughs> At great expense to the city. Okay, I'm sure it and is. And the population is most affected. I'm sure it is, yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not so much for coming in and just doing an all-out sweep. Uh, and I've, I've watched the, uh, the cleanup process up at Northgate, the little circle there at Northgate and, uh, and I-5. 
Uh, they came in one day, the city officials cleaned it all up, took all the tents down, all the trash away, but looked like a great, nice little lawn again. Within a week, everybody was back there camping out again. So I don't know what the rules are pertaining to how long a person who is seemingly homeless can stay on their public properties. Uh, what's allowed, what's not allowed. I, I've always heard if they have a, an alternative place to stay, then they have to move to that alternative place to stay. When they're coming in to sweep these guys up, where are they taking them to? Nowhere. They don't no. take them anywhere. No. They just, they just take their stuff. Just take their stuff. Sometimes they're sent to, Clean taken to shelters, but yeah, yeah. they lose their belongings. They lose. Yeah, everything. I wouldn't be in favor of that. So let me let me take a closer look at that uh, once, once I get on the council. Uh, homeless issues will be something I work very closely with, uh, and mental health as well. Thank you. All right, softball. So 10 years ago, I remember sitting here, not in this room, but interviewing you when you ran for mayor. Yes. Um, and I think Clayton and I are probably the only ones still on the board who were here back then. Yeah. But I'm wondering, what did you learn through that campaign? Um, and how does it inform your current campaign? I don't mean so much what it's like being a candidate, but what did you learn about the city? What did you learn about politics or about your own approach to yeah. politics that informs your run this year? Well, I'll tell you, one thing I really learned was uh, I learned about life a lot over the last decade. Uh, even myself at 61 years of age now, uh, over the last few years, I've had tremendous changes in my life. Um, no longer being a business owner after 28 years with the Donaldson Clinic, uh, going through financial stress and struggles with the Great Recession that we all came out of, here we are 10 years later. Uh, so I was fighting that back for 10 years before I finally just couldn't win that fight anymore. Uh, going through medical issues, I had uh, emergency open heart surgery back in January 2015 for an aortic dissection, which uh, the doctors assumed that 98% fatal. So there's a very, very slim chance. So I pulled through all of those things. Uh, going through a divorce uh, of a wife of five years who, um, she was from another country, so she came and when she got her green card, she left the marriage. These things sent me into a mental spiral downhill. Uh, where I was really entertaining uh, suicidal ideologies. And uh, it got me into the world of mental health. I have my own foundation set up now, Your Gift of Life Foundation. And I go around talking to young people, especially about hanging in there no matter what they're going through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jason, what's first? Oh, Jason, sorry. Um, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about your foundation and mental health and people with disabilities, et cetera, and so on? Yes, yes. The foundation is newly found. We, we opened it, uh, or established it with the state of Washington in January of this year. Uh, as I was going through my, my mental challenges and issues of depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, uh, and it went on for 12 months at least uh, that I was in that deep, dark spot. Uh, as I finally started emerging out of that and seeing a little bit of daylight at the end of the tunnel, that there was hope for tomorrow, there was a reason to live, there was something to look forward to, uh, the ideal came to mind of, of being able to help others uh, and being able to provide resources to young people especially. Uh, we're, we're losing two, two school-aged kids a, a day here in the state of Washington to suicide around the state, two a day. And that's between the ages of 10 and 18. And that's a, that's a horrible number. And anybody has to suffer through the loss of someone via suicide or is left behind and not understanding what's going on, it's a very difficult place to be. So uh, I, I can address more of that foundation as we can move forward if you'd like to hear more about it. Great. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, I believe you filed on Friday, and one of the benefits to filing on the last day is you know what the field looks like. Sure. So, what is it that you bring to the table that the other candidates don't? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, it's a great question. I think I bring a world of experience. Um, not only being of age now, 61 years old, and being around long enough to see a lot of things and to know a lot of things, I've seen the evolution, the changes of Seattle from 1980 until now. Uh, I've been a longtime resident in the same neighborhood in, in Magnolia uh, since 1981. I've been in the same house, same neighbors. Uh, I, I know the lay of the land. I know the different communities around town. Uh, I, I love Seattle and speak it up every time I travel abroad. 
Uh, and so I bring that, I bring a world of business experience, so I know how to balance, uh, you know, budget sheets and profit and loss statements and, and create a budget and all those kind of things. I did that for 25 employees for 30 years. Uh, I'm into education and really training our young folks of being educated, being responsible, being accountable as they grow up. And now with the mental health piece, being able to add that to them as well, so they have a place to go when they're struggling in, in life. Um, now we are ready for a 30 second uh, wrap up. Okay, from me? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going around here. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to all of you today. Uh, as I mentioned, I do bring a lot of great experience, life experience, uh, even more so uh, to the city council campaign. And uh, if elected, I would be able to serve our community of Seattle very well, our District 7 very well. Uh, I'm well known in the community, well known around town, highly visible, I, I can't hide. <laughs> so uh, uh, people come up and talk to me all day. My life has been in the public sphere for 45 years, being a professional athlete. So I'm very used to uh, you know, being in front of the public, very used to talking to folks on the street. Uh, and I bring in a great set of skills to the city council and want to implement those for you. Thank you very much, James Donaldson.